Vishnowska's family. Mary Vishnowskina, with her three sons, were deported to Irkutsk, Siberia, for 11 years. The letters were written to her husband, Povilas Vishnowskas, who was living in North Bay, Ontario. Due to fear of unknown reasons, they needed to use an intermediary, Mr. P. Bookis, who was living in Toronto, Ontario. The letters were sent to Mr. Bookis, and he would relay them on to Mr. Vishnowskas, and packages and support were in like ways went through Mr. Bookis. We do not know the reason uh, for this need for uh, secrecy. The only reason that she and her three sons were able to survive is because Mr. Vishnowska sent her packages over 10 years at a cost of $25,000. Now accounting for inflation and changes in value of U.S. and Canadian currency, this value approximates almost one quarter million current U.S. dollars. The circumstances of how Mrs. Vishnowskas and their sons were deported and Mr. Vishnowskas was working and living in North Bay, Ontario, are not known. Maria Vishnowskina. When we left our hillside, we had to live in various different ways. In order to feed the children, I sold my last dress to purchase potatoes. It was not possible to purchase them with money, and also we had very little money, so I traded everything. We were left just with the clothes that we were wearing and two small pillows. So in comparison to the past, we are now living very well. However, anything can happen in the future. You can have money today, gone tomorrow. We cannot save anything for tomorrow. Merchandise is also difficult for us. Everything is very expensive. An average quality suit costs 1,500 rubles. A good quality suit, forget it. You would have to work an entire year to purchase one. Should you have enough money, you will not be able to purchase necessary items. Now we actually have everything we need, food, meaning potatoes, various vegetables, milk, and meat. At times, we are able to save and purchase something. If you would like to eat well for a full day's wages, you could purchase one good meal. It is better to breathe fresh air and drink fresh water. These are for free. There is still no physician. We do not have our own house. It is all right living in government housing. It is actually more convenient than what you have. Everything is close. From the bed, I can reach the table, and from the table, I can reach the stove. Under the table are the chicken. In one corner is the pig, in the other a lamb. You do not have to walk very far. Work is 10 kilometers away. After walking that distance, a worker is not much of a worker. First you have to rest, only then you can work. But what can you do? There's no other choice, so it's all right. They did not know how we live, and they did not want to know. We had exchanged several letters. I made a request. Should you have any leftovers, even any dried bread, please send us a small parcel. Starvation is staring us in the face. After that, I received no further letters. Mrs. Vishnowskina, upon arriving in Siberia with the three young sons, had to sell basically all the clothing they had, except what they were wearing, to buy a handful of potatoes just to survive the first few days. It's amazing how she describes the small living space and how convenient that everything is within arm's reach if you can imagine living in that kind of an environment. And usually it's felt that under adversity, people support each other and help each other out. Well, there's an example where that is not the case, where adversity sometimes brings out the worst in people. The Abramovich's family. Morta Abramovichiene was 67 years old and her husband Stanislavas was 74 years old at the time of deportation. Uh, Mr. Abramovich has died three years later. They served their term in Tinsk in the Krosnoyarsk district. After seven years of hard labor, her health was broken. She was so frail and weak that she was transferred to the Tupik Sanitarium in the Sharinsky district of Kakazia for one year to recover. It was while she was in the sanitarium that she was able to write letters to one of her daughters in Chicago. 
In the early 1900s, Mr. and Mrs. Abramovichus had both independently traveled to work in the United States. They met in Braddock, Pennsylvania. Almost certainly, he worked in the coal mines and she provided support services. They were married in 1906. With her two young daughters, they returned to Lithuania in 1913 and bought a small family farm. In total, they had two daughters and four sons. During World War II, one son died and the other children moved to the United States. When she returned to Lithuania from Siberia, she found all of the, their farmhouses burn, burned to the ground. She went to the nearby larger city, Mariampolia, where she lived and died 10 years later. She was able to survive only because her children continued to send her packages. Marta Abromavicina. I was left without my loving husband, Stanislavas. He died in 1951. I am by myself in a sanatorium in Siberia. My health is weak. I am over 70 years of age and my eyesight is very poor. My eyes have deteriorated and I cannot find any eyeglasses here. So dear daughter, I beg of you, please send me eyeglasses. Are my grandchildren grown up? Please send photographs of them for me to enjoy while I am still alive. You asked, where is your father buried? I buried him in the Krasnoyarsk region, in the Tinks Sanatorium Cemetery in the forest. He died because his feet froze and an operation was done. He became very weak and then there was his advanced age. When he returned from the hospital, he survived only four weeks. He died from pneumonia. Besides him, our neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Goraitis, both died, along with their daughter, Mary. I would like to thank Onita for the money she sent, 50 in current U.S. dollars. I had to go to the bank to exchange the money. Transportation there and back cost $20, so not much was left. Please do not send me any more money. It is much better for you to send a package. Traveling in the cold is very difficult for me. I live amongst a large number of people. When I get a package, everyone crowds around, eyes popping out, waiting for what they will get. If you give something to one person, someone else becomes upset. So actually, I give away most of what is in the package. Very little is left for me. It has been a long and cold winter. Products in Siberia are expensive. One egg costs one ruble, 250 in current US dollars. One kilogram of butter, 35 rubles, 88 in current US dollars. I'm concerned that I may have to provide for myself when they discharge me from the sanatorium. Rosalia Stulginskianas, son, Father Vatslova Stulginskis, was a deacon at the Konis Theological Seminary. In 1941, he was murdered by occupying German Nazi forces. In 1947, because she owned a small family farm, she was deported to Siberia by occupying Stalinist forces. She was imprisoned near the town of Igarka in the Krasnoyarsk region for seven years. Upon completing her term, she was so frail and weak that she was transferred to the Tupik Sanatorium in the Sharinsky district of Khakhaskia. This is the same sanatorium where Mrs. Abromovichiena was, and they actually became acquainted. While there, Mrs. Stulginskiena wrote letters to try to find her one living son, Alfred. She received a letter from her nephew, Father Yankas, of the Church of the Resurrection in Los Angeles, California, who found out that her son was working as a lumberjack in rural Canada. Father Chekovichus of St. Raphael's Church in Long Island City, New York, found out that Alfred was actually living in Toronto and wrote that he would try to find a mailing address. In the two letters written by Mrs. Stulginskiena from Tupic, she tremendously regrets not hearing from her son. In May 1956, she returned to Lithuania 
where she died within a few weeks. She is not related to the Lithuanian president, Alexandra Stulginskis. Rosalia Stulginskiena, and I likewise most sincerely send you best wishes and greetings. Thank you for all of your heartfelt assistance. I wish you Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I have not received any letters from Alfred. I am hopeful that he will write. This summer, I arrived at the Tupic Sanitarium, having lived for seven years in the city of Igarka. With your mother, we became best friends. We now feel as if we are relatives. She's very sweet and honorable. May God bless you and give you health. The Marma family. In the photograph is Constancia and Jonas Marma and their three children. They were deported to the Krasnoyarsk region of Siberia from their family farm near Shake. They worked in the forest industry for 10 years there. Mr. Marmas's uncle was Dr. Vincis Gudirka, the author of the Lithuanian National Anthem. Possibly it was because of this familial relationship that they were deported. The letters were written to Mr. Alfonsas Retuvninkas in Chicago. Jonas Marma. Remembering the past, it appears to have been a horrible nightmare. But no, it was reality. And despite it, we survived. We barely survived. Our health has been destroyed. You wrote that health care costs are expensive. For us, it is very good. We do not have to pay anything for medical care. However, there are no medicines available. And nobody cares. It would be better to pay and at least feel that your health is improving instead of waiting to see if the illness clears or not. What can you do if that is God's will? The climate here is difficult. The winters are long and cold with temperatures frequently 55 to 60 degrees below zero with snow up to your armpits. Summers are short and hot and have similarities to the winters. It is now the end of July and the daytime temperature is 50 degrees. At night, the temperature falls to below freezing, destroying the potatoes that are our main food. In addition, during the summer, there are the bugs, small flies and mosquitoes. You need to wear nets over your face, similar to those we wore when beekeeping. Otherwise, it would be impossible to be outside. Of course, we should not expect anything good. They deported us to such a place where survival is difficult. We are 7,000 kilometers from Lithuania. To return without permission is impossible. Maybe the earth of Siberia will give us ultimate shelter. As a mother, she will embrace us with her cold and strong arms, and we will never see our dear country again. Fate has cast us into a bottomless pit, but you must survive. Our entire family cannot be allowed to die. October 27, 1957. We received our documents and can return to our homeland. We were extremely happy, as were others. Several, having sold all their possessions to purchase train tickets home, hurried to leave. But all of those who left were sadly disappointed. What met them in Lithuania was the same ill fortune that met us here when we arrived in Siberia. We learned both from letters and from those who have returned to Siberia that the people in Lithuania have changed. They've been re-educated. No one is waiting for us to return with outstretched arms. In the immediate future, we have no plans of returning to Lithuania. In the letters from Siberia, love of country is a recurrent theme in everybody's letters. Longing to return is a constant recurrent theme. So it was so surprising for me to come across in the Jonas Marmas letter, the decision not to return to Lithuania. This opinion shows up in several other individuals also. He, he gives a very clear explanation of what has taken place during the decade that they were deported to Siberia. The local people had been re-educated. They had changed. Nobody was waiting for them. And if you, on reflection, you think about it, 
people who own small family farms, like the Marmus family did and others, everyone that they knew who were similar to them were either deported or killed or escaped to the West, to North America, South America, and to, to Europe. They really had no support system left. They also realized that all their possessions were confiscated. Their small family farms no longer theirs. They're part of large collective government-owned uh, farms. And the mentality of the people had totally changed too. They had been re-educated. So it was difficult to re-assimilate. The majority of people who were deported and had the opportunity to, re to return did. But a very sizable percentage could not return. And the harsh life of Siberia turned out to be more accommodating than the even more harsher reality of life in Soviet Lithuania.